Great. Well, while everyone else is just getting tucked in here, I'm just going to remind everyone again that if you want to turn off your camera, we invite you to do that for now. We know that in especially rural areas, the bandwidth can be a bit of a challenge if everyone's camera is on, so we invite people to do that. There will be time at the end for questions, which we'll use to chat feature. Um, but if somebody really felt at that point they want to use the camera for a question, they can do that. Uh, my name is Maggie McIntyre. I'm the executive director with ANSOM, the Association of Nova Scotia Museums. Uh, ANSOM is the Provincial Museum Association for Nova Scotia, and we work with museums all across Nova Scotia. And we're really excited to see so many of our museums here in this session, as well as so many guest museums from all over uh, the world, in, in a sense. Um, this session is a really exciting way to kick off one of our new programs here in Nova Scotia. Uh, this year is the launch and pilot of our new TRAC program, which stands for Training Resources. Uh, I'm blanking on this. Sorry, guys. Uh, training resources, assessment, coaching, and knowledge sharing. And so I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that this is going to be one of our, in a series of talks that we're doing in encouraging museums to both look at museum standards and ways that museums can go beyond museum standards to play a different role in their community. As we get started, I also want to take a moment to acknowledge that the Association of Nova Scotia Museums is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn on this territory in mutual respect and gratitude. So on that note, I actually just wanted to quickly introduce our ANSOM staff to anybody who doesn't know them. Um, as you are working with the TRAC program, we hope that you have an opportunity to work with us more for all the museums in Nova Scotia. So many of you would know Karen, and I'll let Karen do a very quick hello so her screen will light up. Hey everybody, uh, super excited that you're all with us today to uh, hang out with Mike. And I hope this is um, just a really wonderful opportunity for you to uh, learn something new and stretch how we think about how we're working. And I also want to do a quick hello and a very special thank you to Crystal. This is Crystal's uh, last week with us at Ansem. Crystal has been the member services coordinator. So going back to her regular role um, but Chris led a wonderful winter with us, and everyone would just like to say hi to Crystal. And Crystal, you want to say hi and thank you again publicly for all the work you've been doing with our members over the last year. Oh, my pleasure. Hi, everybody. I'm really, really, really excited. Um, I see everybody's hi, everybody in the chat. Uh, yeah, I'm just excited to learn lots, and I've been very. Um, very thankful for my time with Ansem. I've known Karen a very long time and uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know Maggie. And yeah, that's it for me. Let's, let's start the show. <laughs> so on that note, I'm excited to turn this over to Mike and I'm gonna actually let you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your book. It's been a great inspiration. We've all been reading it down here and really enjoying it, sparking a lot of really great conversations. And we hope this is going to be a nice way to start our new season and the new, new direct steps forward we're taking with museum work, um, especially in this post-COVID world. I was telling Mike that the first cruise ship in two years was here in Halifax, and I feel it's the first time that things are coming back to normal and there's a lot of hope in the museum sector. So I'm really looking forward to that. So on that note, I'm going to turn this over. Great. Thank you, Maggie. Um, and yeah, thanks to everyone uh, with the Association of Nova Scotia Museums for inviting me to, to speak to you all today. And thank you all for being here and sharing in this space together. I loved the intros and seeing where everybody's coming from and connecting from in terms of uh, places, but also all these amazing institutions. I, I love visiting, um, you know, museums and history, historic sites and everything. So, um, and I have never been to Nova Scotia. So I'm just like making my list <laughs> and seeing all these incredible places. Um, 
So a little quick introduction um, in terms of um, sort of my background and where I come from. I am connecting with you all here. Um, I'm here, located here in Portland, Oregon. So just like 3000 miles to the west um, on the other coast. Um, I am here on the ancestral lands of the Tualatin, Clackamas, Chinook, Kalapuya, Oregon, Tumwater, Malala, um, and many other tribes um, that have called this place home um, since time immemorial. <clears throat> um, my background is um, in museum education, and I have worked in museums as well as in higher education for about the last 20 years. Um, and uh, working most recently as Director of Learning and Community Partnerships here at the Portland Art Museum, um, here where I live. Uh, but my passions have been uh, especially focused on, you know, community engagement. How do we make museums be more community-centered? Um, super interested in just how we can be more human in the work we do within these institutions and then also really centering a lot of the equity work um, that I think is just core to just building better museums and continuing to you know, make these institutions be so key within the communities that we're located within. So a lot of my museum practice has been focused on that. Um, one of the, so about two years ago, um, I was one of, gosh, like tens of thousands of people, I feel like, who um, left museum positions and careers because of layoffs, furloughs, staff restructurings, because of the pandemic. Um, and so one of the things that that allowed me to do is uh, engage in a lot of consulting work and work with institutions really all over the world these last couple of years. Uh, but I was also able to finish a book that I'd been working on called Museums as Agents of Change. And um, Awesomely enough, that book came out about almost exactly a year ago, <clears throat> and um, I'm going to share just some of the ideas from that, but rather I'm not going to like be doing a book presentation. Um, I'm kind of sharing ideas that came out of that and then just continued thinking that I've done around both institutional change, but also personal change and the work that we can do um, just build a better future for museums and, and keep these institutions more community centered. Um, so I'm really excited. It's been exciting to see um, how many sort of smaller institutions there are, um, you know, within the group that's joined us today. And everything that I'm saying, I almost feel like because I've been asked this question before, you know, is it easier to do this work in larger museums? for smaller museums. And I actually think a lot of this change practice is way more manageable and doable within small institutions. Um, and to keep our focus on being more people-centered, it's easier to do in the small institutions that <clears throat> oftentimes don't have these massive layers of bureaucracy and hierarchy and structure. So to many of you that are you know, here today participating and listening to this, um, I hope that what you hear feels very doable and very um, sort of resonates with you and the work that you're already doing. So let me move over to share some slides with you and I will get started. And then we'll, I would say um, before I share my slides, definitely uh, if you have questions, go ahead and add them into the chat as I'm speaking. And um, I have the chat open and I'll try to keep an eye on it. But Maggie, if you can also keep an eye on it, no, don't worry about, you know, interrupting me. I love taking questions like right when they're relevant. So please do add them in the chat or whatever you need to do <laughs> to get attention to your question. Um, okay, and then we'll, but we'll make sure to have time, you know, at the end for questions. And if people want to, you know, unmute their microphones and chime in with questions or, um, you know, whatever your, your internet bandwidth will allow, um, that sounds great. And we'll have some time for some discussion at the end. So if you also want to just jot down your question on a sticky note and wait till the end, that's good too. Um, all right, let me jump in. Share my screen. So um, recently I've become super passionate about this idea about agents of change and agency for change and the role that we all have in sort of shaping the future of museums. And um, I think it's become something I'm interested in because there is a lot of work to do to sort of continue to <clears throat> improve museums, to continue to, to allow these institutions, our institutions to become more, more sort of local, more community-centered, more equitable. 
And uh, I think instead of sort of there being those, you know, activists and change makers that are doing the work and then the rest of us, I think it's everyone's role and responsibility. And I'll talk more about that, but I just, I just sort of, have, you know, kind of titled this presentation that we all have a role in shaping the future of museums. And I really do believe that. I think that's an important aspect of this work um, and this practice. Let's see if I can get my slides to move forward here. There we go. <clears throat> I wanted to start out with asking you all a question around change and see if you can, I'm gonna ask you maybe just to respond in the chat because it'll be much more quick um, in terms of this, but take a look at this question. How comfortable are you with change? And take just a moment and reflect on your own personal comfort with change. And then I kind of have a, a little bit of a spectrum here from on the far left being very comfortable with change so bring it on, I am ready for everything, all the way over to, you know, just really being uncomfortable with change, that you're, you're just comfortable with the way things have been done. And I will say there's no, there's no judgment on anywhere that you are on this spectrum, but I think it's about reflecting and being honest with our own comfort with change. So take a moment, and then in the chat, I've seen people already started, um, go ahead and respond to this, and I will and we can all take a look at where people are in terms of their comfort with change. I'm seeing a lot of somewhat comfortable here. I'm scrolling back up to make sure I'm not missing people. Uh, oh, some bring it ons, very comfortable. That's interesting to see, somewhat comfortable. So like in the middle a little bit, but probably comfortable with it. Um, not sure to bring it on. So kind of on that end of the spectrum, somewhat uncomfortable. Yeah, I think that's, these areas in the middle, I think, are important for us to sort of recognize. Somewhat comfortable. Got some more bring it on, some more not sures. And yeah, someone put depends on the issue, right? Um, it, this very much depends on. <laughs> I had a conversation with a, um, with a group recently, and some people said, well, in my work, I'm very bring it on. I'm very open to change. But in my personal life, I cannot handle any more change. <laughs> I'm so, you know, wanting things to be sort of the way they were. I want to get back to some sort of, you know, stability. Um, so those of you that have written kind of depends on the situation. I think very much so. It's really human to think about um, that our response to change can be very different based on what sort of area of our life it is. Um, yeah, someone put personally somewhat to very comfortable, but that doesn't always reflect in their job. So yeah, we can sort of have very different levels of comfort with change. Um, thanks for, for sort of diving in and responding, everybody. I think this is actually, um, you know, if, if the rest of this presentation just kind of fades for you, this could be one tool that you could take away with you. This is actually like this, you could literally take a screenshot right now. <laughs> this is a tool that you can use. You can have these conversations with your volunteers, with your staff, with board members, with local community members, or maybe you have a, a community advisory board. Um, li listen uh, to each other around this idea of comfort with change as we engage in, you know, in any aspect of change within our organizations and institutions. We don't often know where our comfort lies. And so all this is, is a tool to grow empathy and to listen to each other and understand our relationship with change. And I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later in my presentation, but I've been finding that understanding our relationship with change is a key like personal step in doing a lot of this work that I think um, you know, is really urgent for museums and, and historic institutions to be taking on these days. So, so this is just a super simple way to kind of have those conversations you know, at the beginning of a, you know, a volunteer training session that you've got, um, you know, may have pizza, <laughs> put this up on the screen <clears throat> and have people break up into small groups and just chat about it for like three minutes. Um, and I think it can start to build a lot of connections and empathy in a really powerful way. Um, okay, let me dive into the first part of what I want to sort of talk with you all about, which is this idea that emerged as I was really writing the book um, and thinking about museums and the role they play and how can we start to make more change happen. And so I really like this idea of a human-centered museum or a people-centered museum. 
And um, for me, that is, uh, and I'll share a few slides about this, but it's really about prioritizing this idea that museums are human-centered endeavors. They're not just buildings with collections, that museums are made of people and they're really about people. Um, and I think one of the powerful phrases that I like a lot is museums are us. Um, now it isn't to say that they aren't also buildings and collections, but I think if we start to prioritize the people-centered aspect, um, that that can be a really powerful way to be thinking about museums. And uh, I couldn't help but to include this. Um, I think <laughs> when I sometimes present to younger audiences, they're like, I don't understand what this is referring to, but hopefully many of you um, get the connection with Soylent Green and um, <laughs> Charlton Heston here. So it's always good for a little bit of a lighthearted laugh. <laughs> um, I wanna bring up this quote to help kind of illustrate this idea of what it means to be more hum human centered. And I think the, the urgency of this idea of being more human really did become front and center as the pandemic began. And as we were all, you know, our lives were just irreversibly changed, I think, through the experiences we were having in this pandemic and, and continue to have. And Kathleen Osta, who's the managing director of the National Equity Project here in the United States, um, this was something that she wrote right in April 2020, right as the pandemic sort of was in its initial, you know, sort of increase um, and spread. And she wrote, how might we use this global crisis to reorder our priorities and live in ways that increase our collective well-being? And I've emphasized some key phrases here on the slide. Uh, she continued by writing, how might we organize our lives at the interpersonal level and lead change at the institutional and structural level with the awareness that we belong to each other, that every human being is worthy of our attention and care? And finally, she wrote, what might, what might be possible for ourselves and for future generations if we decided to live and to lead with this value? Um, and I continue to, to go back to this quote for the past two years and just bring it to the center of our attention around human care, belonging, collective well-being. You know, if, you know, if at the end of the day, these are the things that we're focusing on as we make decisions about, you know, budget and collections care and interpretation and education and who gets to join our board, I feel like we're doing a pretty good job. Um, and we're sort of doing this human-centered work. So um, this has been a really powerful quote and sort of idea for me as I keep thinking about this. So as I mentioned, the need for, I think at least the need for a human-centered approach to museums has never been more urgent as we've experienced this uh, pandemic. So I wanna just cover a few sort of aspects of this human-centered museum. Um, and then after I do that, I'm gonna focus on what I call human powered change. So these are things that I think are much more action oriented to make change happen. So we'll start with these sort of aspects and elements of a human centered museum, and then move on to some action based uh, ideas around change. What I hope that you see <clears throat> as I go through all of these things are not things you've never heard of, not things you're like, I've never thought of that before. But instead, I hope you're seeing things that that connect with you, that resonate, that feel right, <clears throat> but that maybe <clears throat> you need to just amplify in your own practice or turn the dial up a little bit on. Um, and maybe you come away from this with just one of these ideas and you and that is enough. You know, you write that down on a sticky note, focus on that for the next, you know, X number of days or months. And I think that is an incredible way to sort of have a takeaway from this presentation rather than I think there's 10 things <laughs> that I'm sharing with you. So find the one or maybe find the two that you really feel uh, maybe you aren't focusing on enough in the work that you're doing within your organization or within your community. So I want to begin with connecting with human core values. I think sometimes when we, especially in a lot of the equity work happening within museums, we're jumping ahead of many of these steps, but forgetting why we're doing this. <clears throat> you know, we're sort of like, oh, well, we'll go to grant funding for that. So we better get ahead and do that. Or there's this foundation that's asking us to do this, or you know, even a professional association. But I think it's important to take a step back and figure out like why, why is decolonization 
important for our institution to engage with why or re-indigenizing you know our institution or building more community partnerships why is that important <clears throat> and i think what we've done is we've skipped over the core values conversation um, and so i think there needs to be a little more time sometimes focused in on what are our, what are those values what matters most to me as an individual and then sometimes that take that step to the institution. What are our institutional core values based on the people that are part of the institution, not based on some, you know, white paper that you read that had some really great words in it. Like, you know, sometimes I see an institution and their core values are excellence, integrity, innovation, and I ask the staff, do these things like get you up in the morning? And, and do you feel like those reflect your personal values? And Everyone says, no, absolutely not. <laughs> you know, I don't get, get up in the morning and think I'm going to drive for excellence today. You know, oftentimes you get up in the morning and you're thinking, I value kindness, compassion, family, community, uh, belonging. And so what would it mean for those values to be part of our institutional environments? What changes would need to happen for those values to be reflected in our work? Um, and I have this quote from a sort of organizational development um, leading scholar, uh, Steve Patty, and in his book, Moving Icebergs, which is a pretty interesting book around sort of how to lead lasting change. He writes, every organization needs to hold candid conversations about values and beliefs, purpose and meaning. And so I think it's never too late to take that big step back and start to think about what matters most to us as individuals and then how do we bring those values together to inform the work that we're doing as an organization so another thing that i think is really important is this idea of prioritizing relationships centering relationships and for me um, and it's it's been i think um within the museum community it still i think remains to be a little bit of a provocative idea but this question of what if we prioritize our relationships with people over the objects in our collections? And I can rephrase that a little bit. Um, and I, it, I was interviewed by the USA Today last year. And in this article, uh, they were talking about the Smithsonian's um, practices around returning uh, objects, especially around objects in countries in Africa like Benin. <laughs> um, and, um, and I said, the museums need to shift their prioritize from objects to relationships with the communities those objects belong to. So how can we start to think about the people that these objects represent, the stories? And, and I think this is one of those things where like, I know that many of you are doing this. And so I think it's just putting that question in front of us. How are we prioritizing relationships um, you know, over objects or in addition to objects? Um, how are we prioritizing our relationship with communities that those objects belong to? Um, I think that can be a really powerful question as we work with our collections and work with our communities. So this leads right into the idea of centering community. There's long been discussion around this idea of community outreach and community engagement but i think what that does is it's sort of based on this principle that the community is out there um here out there <laughs> and that we aren't part of our communities and that museums are sort of separate and i think we've got to get rid of that idea and that language and start to think about how we can center community, how we can bring local community and make them a core part of our institutions. Now, this is um, probably happening more effectively at really small organizations that probably were founded by community members, neighborhood members. Um, and as I saw, saw the list of museums pop up in the chat at the beginning. I saw names of institutions that to me felt like that feels like a museum or a historic site or a historic house that feels like it probably popped up as an institution because people that lived in that neighborhood or in that community cared about preserving this space. Um, and so that I think is different than sometimes these large organizations um, that might be created with a much bigger mission in mind. Um, and sometimes the community doesn't get centered as much within those types of institutions. Uh, yeah, and I'm looking in the chat and seeing um, community can definitely have 
lots of different meetings and different needs. Thanks for bringing that up early. Um, yes, in fact, one of the workshops that I've done with museums um, several times now is just going through that process of defining what you mean by the word community. And, um, and that I think is a really rich and useful process because we use that word. I'm even using it a lot, <laughs> but it's gonna mean something different for, for each of you um, and for different institutions. And I hope you're spending the time defining that and exploring what that means for your own work because um, that's an important process not to skip over. So thank you for, for adding that comment in. Um, one definition of, of sort of this idea of community that I wanted to mention before I move on uh, comes from Stacy Marie Garcia. Stacy worked at the uh, Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History um, here in California on the West Coast. And uh, under the direction of Nina Simon, who's also written several books about museums, the participatory museum, um, the art of relevance, and how can museums become you know, really relevant to their local communities. In fact, uh, Nina Simon's gone on to, to found a nonprofit called Of By For All, which is just about making sure museums are all about local community um, ownership. <clears throat> so Stacy, uh, in the work she did at the Museum uh, of Art and History in Santa Cruz, um, reflected and wrote that it's not solely about how museums can serve communities, but rather what are the community's resources, knowledge, and interests that can instead inform museum practice. So how can museums actually change based on the knowledge and expertise that our communities have? Um, and I've always said uh, this idea that our communities know more than we do. Um, so in a traditional museum model, you know, it's hard to imagine a curator knowing as much as the knowledge base of our entire community. So we've got to tap into that. And, and Stacy continues uh, by saying, you know, how can museums and communities work together to share strengths in the community? Um, and so I love these ideas of really centering community within the museum, not just reaching out to communities. Um, the, uh, next, the idea of rethinking leadership, I think is really important And this. It does not matter the size of an organization. It could be a single staff or a volunteer led organization. And I think this idea of leadership is really important and really key to be thinking about. Um, it's not just this idea of a CEO um, in a big museum. In fact, we need to get rid of that idea <laughs> of leadership because leadership comes from everywhere and can come from anywhere. Um, and so I think thinking about leadership as being more human, um, challenging the hierarchies that we think of when we think of leadership, um, no matter what the size of your organization, thinking of leadership as collaborative and collective and a shared endeavor. So how can we have leadership be an experience that we're working together with within an organization or with community members and community leaders and stakeholders? Um, and then, as I mentioned, it exists everywhere. So even if you are at a big museum and there is a big hierarchy, we've got to break that down and understand that leadership exists all the way from the, you know, entry level staff positions, you know, all the way through to the top. And I think these are important changes to be making um, in the way that we think about leadership and how we value leadership. Just keep over that. And then, and then finally, this idea of practicing community care. Um, the word care for me has been something I have thought a lot about in museum practice. And I think sadly, it still isn't talked about enough or written about enough when we look at best practices. I'm just not seeing it emerge enough, but I think it's a word that is worthy of reflection on. And then if you add community to it, I think it connects with these other ideas that I've been sort of sharing with you. Two sort of museum thinkers um, or one museum thinker and one sort of community organizer that I like to bring into this idea of community care. Uh, one is Monica Montgomery, um, who I think is a real leading voice uh, with cross museums here in the US. Um, and Monica has written <clears throat> that when we embrace community care, we're centering an architecture of empathy, advocacy, and social responsibility to honor our humanity. And I really love this idea of bringing empathy into our work through community care? And how are we building that with these communities that we're, you know, quote unquote, serving? And then Nakita Valerio, who is a community organizer um, in New Zealand, 
wrote <clears throat> that community care is, it's trusting that your community will have you when you need support and knowing you can be trusted to provide the same. And that comes from a very community organizing perspective, but I love institutions reflecting on this idea of like, how can, you, if you want your community to have your back, you need to have their back. <laughs> and I think that mutual relationship is really important as we think about museums as institutions that are people-centered. Okay, so one thing that's been really important is not only is this approach human-centered, um, <clears throat> but what I don't want that to imply is some sort of, um, that that could conflict with being planet-centered and really environment-centered. So I sort of add this slide in now, and I'm doing a lot more thinking about this these days. I'm actually, a lot of the work that I do these days is um, doing a lot of place-based education and nature-based and environmental education. And so this idea of museums being more planet-centered is really important. Um, I was asked this question at a conference presentation a couple months ago by saying, you know, by if you're human-centered, aren't we sort of disregarding our, you know, uh, our planet and our responsibility to take care of it? And I thought about it and thought, look, these ideas around connecting with our core values, centering community, practicing care, they all <clears throat> come back to centering and prioritizing our planet as well. And the relationship that we have with this place and this, you know, earth. So I do think it's worth mentioning that all of these things, I think, help us build a more sustainable relationship with the world around us and the more than human world. So worth worth noting, but I am thinking a lot, a lot more about this. And if that's something you're interested in, um, I am definitely going to be doing more work. Um, and there's some great resources out there too to help along this practice. Okay, so let me get to this idea of more action-oriented steps for change. And then I wanna open it up to questions, thoughts, ideas from you all. Um, I gave a presentation last year that I called 1,000 Ways to Reshape the Future of Museums. And everybody was like, really? Is he in, in, in you know, 40 minutes, is he going to get through 1,000 ways <laughs> to reshape the future of museums? Um, and I started with this really powerful idea from Octavia Butler, who is, I think, one of the... Um, you know, one of the best science fiction writers um, maybe in the world, but to come out of the U.S., certainly. Um, and Octavia Butler has written many, many science fiction or speculative fiction books that had taken a lot of the crises that we, you know, have been experiencing these last few decades in our, in our world um, around, you know, wealth inequities, uh, climate change, um, you know, a lot of the um, social inequities happening, and then amplifying those into the future and then creating these worlds and stories and characters within those kind of apocalyptic worlds. So she was giving a book talk <clears throat> and someone at the end came up to her and said, you know, will you create these sort of environments and these worlds where all of these problems are amplified, but what's the answer? Like, what's the solution to all these problems? And she looked at the person and said, there's no single answer that will solve all of our future problems. There's no magic bullet. Instead, there are thousands of answers at least, and you can be one of them if you choose to be. And to me, that's such an empowering idea that there are, you know, all of us have this opportunity to step up and be a solution to one of these problems, to be, you know, kind of an agent of change, a change maker and be a part of this. Um, so I say that as I sort of launch into sharing with you kind of some of these actions for change. So if we want museums to be more human-centered and definitely more planet-centered as part of that, and we want to center community and relationships and, and care, you know, what does that look like? What, what can we be doing and what are these actions if we choose to sort of be part of the solutions? And I think we have a responsibility to sort of transform the future of museums along these lines. So what does human powered change look like? And these are gonna resonate with the things I've already shared with you. Um, I think taking the steps to know what matters most to you. So engaging with this, this exploration of our core values, the self inquiry, take a moment, even if it's just you as an individual, you know, after today and go, you know, ask yourself, you know, what are the things that 
you sort of stand for? What are those values? If, if everything else were to sort of fade away, what matters most to you? Um, and then ask how that, how that shows up in your daily practice. You know, how does your being connect with your doing? Um, or is, does it connect or is there a misalignment? Um, and how can you address that? I think another extremely important action for change is this idea of disrupting white supremacy, disrupting you know, these ideas and practices of colonialism and the status quo. And one of the easiest ways that I've been able to frame this recently is just sort of adopting an ability to slow down and pause and be aware of when these sort of habits and old scripts show up. So, you know, you know, white dominant culture and, you know, patriarchy and a lot of these big systemic forces show up in all of our little daily actions, the way that we, you know, interact in meetings, the way that we're, you know, sort of functioning and a lot of our daily habits. And if we slow down and take the moment to, to acknowledge those, become aware of those, and then start to disrupt those. I think we can take all, you know, a lot of the steps that are needed to make this type of change happen. Um, so it can, you know, kind of be broken down into very small, very small steps. So that is an important part of the change we need to make. <clears throat> Connected to that is this idea of questioning everything. Um, so I've worked in several institutions, but I've also worked with dozens other institutions. And this idea that the questioner is not valued, that we don't want, <laughs> that we don't reward or value, you know, those that kind of always are stopping the meeting and saying, hold on, I have a question, you know, are we doing it right? Have we thought about this enough? And everyone rolls their eyes and is like, oh, can't we just go ahead and, <laughs> and do this? But I think there is an incredible value in, in, in that idea of questioning and that mindset of, of pausing, slowing down, asking questions. <clears throat> um, this can be key to disrupting a lot of those systemic forces that are happening, you know, that we're sort of in the current uh, with. Um, so when we need to develop a questioning mindset, but also, you know, make sure that we acknowledge those that also bring that to the table and say, you know, thank you. Let's just pause for a moment and make sure we're addressing these questions, especially if they're coming from you know, our communities, if there are, you know, uh, people that are community, you know, advisory groups, and they're saying, I really have questions about what you're doing. I think that's a key moment to pause <clears throat> and embrace that questioning mindset. We've talked a lot about um, prioritizing relationships. And so I just added that into this idea of changes we need to enact to make, you know, to make more museums more human-centered and more equity-centered <clears throat> if we just start to value relationships. And that can happen, you know, in all of our daily interactions. You know, the interactions we have with, you know, colleagues and fellow staff, the interactions we have with volunteers, the, you know, relationships that we build um, with, you know, community stakeholders. Um, you know, maybe there are indigenous communities we're working with and are we, are we building trust? Are we prioritizing long-term relationships or are we thinking them as one-offs? You know, who do we need to connect with to get this thing done and then move on? Um, I would not call that a relationship. Um, and so let's, let's move away from, from transactional relationships and move toward building trust, building sustainable relationships that are more long-term. So I think this is something you can start doing right away um, and, and can make change happen through that. Okay, second to last is <clears throat> understanding our relationship with change. You're, you're already doing this by being part of this session today and having responded to the question around your comfort with change. Um, and so I think prompts like that, questions like that, you know, what, um, what excites you about change? What makes you afraid of change? Constantly reflecting on these questions, you know, what are the changes in your life that you've that have brought you joy and what are the changes that have been the most challenging for you <clears throat> and i think if we explore these questions ourselves and then also start to share that with others that is a really key action that we can take towards making some of this change happen i think it's another thing that we've sort of skipped over um, as you know sort of museum practitioners 
And then last, um, and definitely not least, <clears throat> this idea of building a community of change. A lot of these practices that you see here um, on this slide are things you can definitely do individually, <clears throat> but they are way more powerful if you do it collectively. If you can identify other people within your organization, within your local community, within your neighborhood, you know, with, with what, however you want to sort of define your community, if you can identify others <clears throat> working toward change, other change makers, others who share your values and start to really be intentional about that. Um, and I think that's the, that's the key because I think we think <laughs> that there are a lot of people working with us to make change happen. But I have actually engaged in the practice of going up to people and saying, hey, you're a part of my community of change. Can we sit down and have a talk about, you know, what, what, we're, what our vision is, what our values are, and where this is going? Um, and that can happen, again, as with many of these things, with community members, with colleagues, with, you know, volunteers, having these conversations. Um, if, if there are difficult issues that we're trying to move forward, you know, um, and I know for a lot of institutions these days, you know, some of these decolonizing practices can be challenging because it's kind of going against the way we've always done things, going against the status quo for a lot of institutions. It can feel like you're, you're going against the forces, you're walking upstream in a river if you're doing it by yourself. But imagine you know, walking upstream in a river and you're locking arms with a whole group of people. It becomes a lot easier to engage in these challenging practices and to sort of go against the status quo if you're doing it together. <clears throat> so I sort of end with that idea. Um, and, and again, this Octavia Butler quote, this idea of just to choose to be a solution um, instead of throwing our hands up and being like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> we can all be a part um, of this change. The last note <clears throat> that I wanna share before we get questions, thoughts um, from, from all of you via the chat or even you know, unmute your mic would be awesome, um, is the idea that this is doable. <clears throat> I, and I think that's important because too often I hear from people that well, we don't have the resources or you know, we don't have the extra staff to do this type of work. And I think if you review all of the stuff I've shared with you, you don't need extra budget. You don't need extra resources to do this sort of human-centered work of change. <clears throat> um, you certainly don't need a big staff and you don't need a bunch of committees. In fact, sometimes I, I recommend that institutions you know, get rid of some of the committees. <laughs> that add all these layers to some of these practices um, around change. But, but if you do, but what you can do without adding staff, without having more resources, you can slow down, you can listen, you can start to be more open and more vulnerable in the work that you're doing. And you can find your core values and commit to those in everything that you do, like start from why? Why are you doing these things? Why is this, you know, historic house or this location or this site or this science learning or <clears throat> this historical understanding? Why is that important? Why is it that you're committing so much time, energy, <laughs> um, and so much of yourself to it? Um, and focus on that because I think that helps us lead an incredibly powerful and human-centered practice as we really build a better future for museums. Um, so with that, I have the slide up here. I invite um, you all to sign up for my Agents of Change Substack. It's like a newsletter comes out, you know, once or twice a month. It's going to be building into a bigger community um, as we move throughout the year, but it's free. You can sign up and stay connected that way. Always feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, um, Morawski27. You can direct message me. You can, you know, tweet me a question, anything. It comes up after today that you're wondering about. Um, I'm always happy to respond and, and stay connected that way. But now I'm going to turn my slides off and turn it over to you all to see what questions are, are floating around in your minds or maybe even what are some ideas that have particularly resonated with you, with you in what I've shared today. So let me stop this. And um, yeah, and you can also chat or if you want to unmute, um, I'm sure that there's not uh, too many of us that we can Make sure, oh, yeah, look, look, Maggie, if you can help see if there's a raised hand. Oh, I was gonna say thank you. That was just so perfect for what I wanted to hear. 
Um, your book came out. I was just coming back from maternity leave. And I spent all the pandemic on that leave. And I came back and your book came into my realm at the same time as just this perfect idea of museums are changing and the power that we actually have as individual practitioners and at small museums to do this work was just so inspirational to come back into this new scary post pandemic mm -hmm. world. And so I just really hope that everyone got that. Um, we're going to turn over like Mike said to questions. I see Anita has her question up. So Anita Cody, if you want to unmute yourself. No, when you're talking about, I think we have an excellent to, to connect with communities. And when you were mentioning uh, here in Canada, with the enormous commitment led by the courts and by our national government of truth and rec rec you know, things that all Canadians recognize now, or Canadians of a certain age, um, connection with our Aboriginal, Indigenous, whatever the, the, the language is of the initial settlers of this country. So I'm, I'm representing a tiny little community that's called the Marguerite Salmon Museum, but it's something that we're also grappling with because there are artifacts in that museum that really do not portray this new consciousness. And so we're challenging with how to, um, how to build uh, relationships. Plus mm -hmm. we have the reality of separation previous um Canadians separated us and now we're trying to reconnect so I think it's a with the leadership that's coming from um nationally and provincially a little tiny museum can make a small step uh, we don't know exactly how but I think your words are it, we don't need a big organization we can one-to-one mm -hmm. uh, -one. so we're thinking just having when you walk into the building, um, notice that where are we uh, on unceded territory? That's a tiny step, but it might be yeah. for somebody who walks in the door, an important step. Yeah. So that's, that's yeah. So um, what, what you had to say was uh, resonated because that's something we're grappling with. We, we have a meeting, but we're, some of us behind the meetings are trying to figure out how to do that because there are also people say, oh, well, it really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So how to convince everyone as well, but it is important to, to, to make changes no matter how small we are. Yeah. So thank you for your, uh, your ideas. Yeah, thanks, Anita. I appreciate that. And I think one of the things that, that when you are speaking and sharing kind of where your organization is in the work, I think one key thing is you know, a lot of the times there are, there are so many <clears throat> museums, institutions, and sites around this country and around this continent, you know, mm -hmm. again, here in the U.S. and, but all over, and all over the world that are in the same position of like, well, we, what we've, what we've been as an institution hasn't necessarily responded to the way that we're thinking about history and certainly thinking about how to, you know, treatment of indigenous communities and, and a lot of the conversations happening today um, and I think then what's that, what are those steps? How do you start to engage with that? And I think one thing is, you know, that I, that I think is important is it's not going to be perfect. In fact, it's going to be messy <laughs> and uncomfortable and someone has to take those uncomfortable steps at the beginning, right? Someone has to like, who are the people that, that you can reach out to and try to connect with and have those initial conversations to say, what can we be doing differently? You know, can we bring people into the institution from local indigenous communities and tribes and First Nations and say, you know, literally help us? And the response initially may be, look, you represent the people that have caused a lot of harm and trauma to our communities and your institutions never cared about us in the past. So, so I'm not going to, you know, but it's just, we'll try again. And having being genuine, being authentic and reaching out and and building those relationships. It's gotta start somewhere. Um, and I, I always love the sort of, um, you know, uh, the idea that, you know, the, um, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is right now. And so a lot of organizations are in the place of like, well, if someone had done this <laughs> 20 years ago, we would have, 
we would have a very different present moment. We would have a different relationship. We would have different exhibits or we would have a different, you know, understanding, but, but no one did. So now it's upon us to plant that tree. Um, and I do think it's often can be a very messy process, but as long as you're there for the right reasons, people are listening instead of telling, um, I think it can be, you know, really, really good. I'm looking at the chat because a question or a comment just came in. So. Uh, so the question is, could you please tell us a story about a small museum that has been successful or unsuccessful with these changes? Yes, thank you for that question, um, Deborah. Because that's so, so important. And what I try to do, um, and I know this, this may connect with some of you, but not others. One of the things that I've been trying to do on my Instagram feed, silly enough, um, is uh, if you go to Murawski27 on Instagram, and there's a thing, there's a list of stories, a collection of stories called called uh, Change or Time for Change, and I keep trying to collect and share where the change is happening. But let me tell you about one smaller museum that's local here in Portland, Oregon. That I, in fact, let me um, while I'm introducing it, I will quickly find the link. Um, to the Five Oaks Museum here in Portland, Oregon. Let me share the link up on the screen. They are very worth looking into, um, or not on the screen, but I'll share the link in the chat. Um, so the Five Oaks Museum used to be the Washington County Historical Society. Um, super small staff, very small budget, um, you know, a lot of volunteer support in the work that they're doing and a collection that they've sort of, you know, kind of inherited over a period of time. That, that Anita, as you were speaking, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a collection that they have not necessarily chosen to shape the stories they want to tell right now. <laughs> there are a lot of objects in it that likely tell stories that maybe the museum's not interested in telling right now. So um, I want to say just right before the pandemic, um, so just a few years ago, maybe several years ago, but pretty recently, um, the museum just came to a moment where they knew they needed to make a radical change. <clears throat> and the board decided that they needed a change in leadership. And they made a big, bold step in deciding to go with the co-leadership model. So um, uh, Molly Aloy and Nathaniel Andrani are the two co-directors of this museum. They were already on the staff and they stepped up to play this shared leadership role. So they've, they've made that leap, but what they did is they started to completely change their practices across the museum. And, and there are many things that I won't remember here off the top of my head, but they changed sort of who gets to decide on exhibits and exhibitions and, and projects. So they bring in a lot of community curators where they're hiring someone. One of the first projects was to do an exhibit on the, the Kalapuyan people, which are the you know people who have been on the land of their museum since time immemorial. So they did an exhibit, they hired someone who was Kalapuyan to curate the exhibit, to bring the exhibit together. And then it became a museum-based exhibition, but also an exhibition that you could turn into a yard sign exhibition and put at the public library or on a college campus or in your neighborhood. <clears throat> so that during the pandemic, they were able to get it out there, which I thought was really awesome. And it was called, This is Kalapuyan Land. And it was all about this acknowledgement and honoring of these histories that are, you know, often have been largely ignored by a predominantly white, white people. Um, they have, they completely changed their organization's values and along the lines of what I was talking about, their values are based, are like trust and land um, and you know these ideas that I think are really key. Um, and then they budget based on their values. So they do values-based budgeting. Um, they've rethought who could be on their board. Um, and then like programming, you know, everything is really different. And then they're doing a lot of um, decolonizing and uh, decolonization in terms of collecting practices. So as they look at their collection, you know, are there objects that really, you know, would be best served back in their communities of origin? Are there objects that they need to learn more from community members about those objects? Um, so they're just doing a whole process of learning a lot more about um, what they know about the objects, whether they should have the objects, and if they do keep the objects, what's the best way to you know, preserve these objects for 
these communities that are sort of entrusting them with these objects. So they're definitely an institution that's really worth looking up um, and connecting with um, and following the work they're doing, because I think it's really powerful um, and quite incredible. Great. So I have some comments here. Uh, Mary slash Dawn says, working to help host create a safe space, safe space gatherings with communities as they are responding to these changing times with ideas. Stay with it. And Joanne Pepper says, thank you for this wonderful and thought-provoking presentation. And Brenda O oh is says, is it key to identify who the leaders are in your organization or to recruit new leaders? Not everyone will buy into change, no matter what it looks like. It can have a domino effect if it is done slowly, as you suggest, and done in small ways. Small successes will instill confidence, which can lead to more buy-in and success. And I will only comment on that by saying, like, yeah. Yeah, yes, I think as much as I love, like, fast, radical, quick <laughs> change, I think really when it comes down to it, um, especially in you know, groups, people, or organizations that can be a little averse to that type of change. Um, it is the small, you know, small is big, I think is, is kind of the, you know, underlying idea here. Deborah Poole from Lawrence House is saying, we have over the last few years lost our church, elementary school, a destination upriver rafting company, which was an anchor business, almost all the small businesses and B&Bs in our community. My rural Nova Scotia community seems to be shrinking, and I am wondering if you have ever experienced this phenomenon and how do you overcome it? Maybe how you saw it overcome. Yeah, um, I don't have a specific example that I'm thinking of right now, but but I think, you know, I always believe that, you know, museums, um, you know, arts and cultural organizations, history organizations, and, you know, science learning organizations can be um, like a catalyst for community revitalization. And I'm sure like during the pandemic, there's, um, there is a museum worth looking into um, here in the US. Now it's a larger institution, so it's not small and it's urban, it's not rural, but I think they've been engaging in a lot of practices that have really helped uplift their, their neighborhood. Um, and that's the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum. Um, Maggie, if you're able to find a link to that and share it in the chat. Um, so it's in Washington, D.C., but it's in Southeast D.C. in the Anacostia neighborhood. And um, they've just been doing things like providing food for their community during the pandemic when that, that need existed, um, really working with neighbors to create outdoor exhibits. Um, gosh, they were doing something uh, recently about the local river environment, um, which is a really important part of that community and the you know polluted waters and um, how to how to work on that to restore the river to re to sort of then restore the community, <clears throat> um, and even though the context is very different, I love this idea of institutions of any size being kind of a, a hub of a community, and then I think you know exploring what it is that an institution can do to help revitalize that community, bring it back, bring attention, even just you know I think it can be. A psychological thing to uplift people, to celebrate, you know, community stories, storytelling, to bring people together. Um, you know, even if there are, as you're saying, you know, churches and schools and businesses closing, um, there are many museums that I know here in the U.S. that have just done story circles. You know, just you know, memory projects, and how can a museum be a site of remembering the past, um, kind of amplifying the present, and then building a future. So I think in this case, um, there's there's probably a lot of hope and possibility there, rather than the museum seeing themselves as a, you know, well, we're going to close too or something like, you know, I think there's a, a great moment maybe to stand up and, and, you know, take a leadership role in community revitalization. I'm going to give Ash, just watching the time here, Ashley Sutherland, I'm going to give you the last question, but I'm going to read the last, there's one more comment here in the chat, and then I'll turn it over to Ashley to ask a question before we wrap up. Uh, John Solos writes, open-minded, inclusive, mutual respect, empathetic conversations will help encourage buy-in and identify the most appropriate sorts of change. Lots of value to encourage there. So Ashley, I'm going to let you ask the last question. Thank you. Um, 
Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, it certainly really resonated with me. And something else, it kind of seems unrelated, but it resonated with me as you were speaking, was a book that I recently read um, called The Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor, I think her name is. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if you're familiar with it. Um, and it, it really... I feel like it takes this very humanistic approach and relates a lot to what you were speaking of about, you know, understanding um, difference and that everyone has different experiences um, and learning to respect and value all individuals. And that that really, you know, how we see others and ourselves really sort of applies to and informs everything that we do is really at the root of it. Um, and for some weird reason, <laughs> that sort of seemed relatable to this. Um, my question, however, is, you know, sometimes I find one of the challenges is sort of bridging the gap between our sort of older membership who have been with us for many, many decades even, um, and their values and trying to sort of broaden, you know, the community and broaden our values. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, our older membership, they're, they're donors that help keep the doors open here. Um, and it just feels sometimes like there's a lot of expectations that are really um, difficult, sometimes impossible to meet. So I was sort of wondering if you had any advice on, you know, how to maybe get older, their older membership um, that have more traditional ideas of what a museum is and what it should be to sort of buy into change. Yeah, um, thanks, Ashley. I think, well, and I, I am familiar with that book. It's, uh, so thanks for sharing that with that um, <clears throat> and thinking about the connection with, with what I've talked about. Um, yeah, I mean, so what you're sharing is really common. And I think, um, I think there are a couple, I can sort of share a couple quick comments because I'm also looking at the time too. Um, but I'd be happy to, to further, you know, engage um, offline too and talk more about this. Um, one thing I think is, is keeping this idea of empathy at the core of everything means that we are listening to those experiences um, and understanding that that change is, is a challenge instead of ignoring that. Like, I think it's easy to be like, oh, <laughs> you know, we've just got to make this happen. You know, there are going to be people that are going to be upset with it, but we've just got to push forward. Now, that's the reality of a lot of change. But I think you can also say we're going to push forward with this change. And at the same time, we're also going to hold space for those that find it challenging and make sure that you're, you know, I think, again, one of the key things that we can do is, is be a listener and be engaging with you know, a lot of the people who are having challenging experiences around this and, and figure out where that's coming from. Um, and oftentimes no one's ever asking or following up, you know, like why are people, you know, resisting to change? And um, if we take the time, slow down, have more conversations around that, um, I think, you know, as long as it doesn't derail things, I think if it's done the right way, it can be a way to bring people you know, on board, or at least get people to a point of, okay, I see why the change is happening. I don't agree with it, but we can still, you know, we can still like each other, <laughs> you know, come to an understanding that maybe, you know, I, I think the the art of, you know, actually disagreeing, but not, you know, rejecting someone's humanity is like gone these days. But I think we need to bring back to the idea that we can still disagree and still like have love and compassion for each other and move forward and still be in a community together. Um, the other, the last thing that I would say is as we're thinking about a lot of this change, part of it is, you know, sometimes we forget about accessibility and how inaccessible museums can be for older adults, um, you know, that are within our communities. And so many times these you know, individuals you're talking about that might be, you know, older members that might have more traditional ideas, they're not finding the museum particularly accessible either. And I think underneath it, their experience of museums often makes them feel excluded because the text is tiny. I can't go up that many stairs. You know, um, you know, I can't, you know, the, there isn't enough audio amplification that the programs or captioning isn't being provided. 
um, there's no seating. That's like the number one issue. Like we've got to provide <laughs> seating in our institutions. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. You know, can an individual that's using a wheelchair, a mobility device, a walker, a cane, navigate these institutions with ease? Are we really being empathetic and caring towards these members of our communities? And then sometimes like that is a way to bring people in as part of this, not, oh, you're not going to agree with us making these changes, but, you know, but to say these changes benefit you in a great deal. So let's hear what your experience of our institution is like, as well as other marginalized communities, indigenous communities, you know, communities of color, you know, maybe people in low economic neighborhoods um, and bring them into the conversation around the types of change that need to happen. Hopefully that at least is a start <laughs> to addressing some of your concerns and great questions. That's great. Thank you so much. That gives me lots to reflect on for sure. Perfect. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Mike. This was just really the inspiration I think we all needed to start everything off and get us thinking about everything. I'm going to just do a quick reminder to everybody that if your museum has not, and you're in Nova Scotia, has not registered for the track program, we recommend that you do that. There's going to be a lot more opportunities like this that we look forward to offering to you, and hopefully an opportunity to talk to Mike again through the track program. Um, we've also promised that there would be one museum who attended the session and who would be registered for track who will be winning a copy of Mike's book provided by Ansem and we will be in touch with that museum later. Uh, Crystal's madly trying to get that together so we can announce during the meeting or during the thing but that's okay we will make an announcement and somebody will be getting that we'll put that out in our beacon newsletter uh, in the next week. So again, everybody, thank you so much for participating. Uh, we encourage you to follow up with Mike and follow us up with us here at Ansem as we move forward on everything. And we want to wish you all a good rest of the week. Thank you all so much.